Trees make a world of difference between sand and dirt and shaded parks for baseball, picnics and quiet walks, between steamy sun-baked streets and friendly shady neighborhoods. To learn about... Marsha, I'm delighted to be here. Well, many of you may know Marilyn, but I think by the time we get done with this interview, you will have learned things that you never knew about Marilyn. I myself have been reading uh, just a series of things that Marilyn has written, which is basically what we're going to be covering today, her, one of her books and a lot of her articles. And I think you will all be very surprised at all that you've done, uh, in especially literature on women. Thank so, you. Let's, uh, let's begin, as we <coughs> always do, a little bit, Marilyn, with, um, you know, just where you grew up and, uh, and, you know, how you got educated and all that. I mean, where did you grow up? Well, I was born in Donna, Texas. It's a very small town on the Mexican border near Brownsville. And my BA was in Texas at Southern Methodist University, and my MA also. What was your, your BA, what was your major there? Uh, uh, majored in, in American History. In American History. Right. It's been my interest all the way through. Your master's degree, you had a very interesting thesis. Um, what was your thesis on? Um, well, my major also was American history, and I did a local study of the uh, involvement of the, or contributions of the Jewish community to the uh, Dallas mm -hmm. community. Well, why did you pick that? I mean, I think that's very interesting. This was in what year? Um, this was in, actually, it was finished in 1967, but I had uh -huh. started it in 65. Um, this was the post-assassination period in Dallas, and right. um, oh, that's right. it had been where you there was were a lot in of. Um, at that time. I actually was in Norway in graduate school when the assassination occurred, uh -huh. but um, John was there and very involved John in is, student is government. John husband. <laughs> yes. we'll, we'll get to him in just a second. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Uh, and at that point, there was a lot of reevaluation of the community going on in Dallas at the time. Uh, and the Jewish community, there was a rabbi, Olin, there who took a very active part in that. And a lot of us attended the Reform Synagogue um, Temple at that point because he gave a lot of what I would say community lectures. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had, they had obviously played, the Jewish community had played a large role not only in the cultural history of Dallas and in its um, mercantile history but had also been the role of anti-Semitism in the community it was one that I first did a paper on mm -hmm. and then enlarged that to mm -hmm. become a history of the Dallas community, Jewish that's, involvement in the Dallas yeah. community. That's, that's very interesting. And then, then you went on, actually some time lapsed, right? You must have, how did you meet, Marilyn's husband is John Hill. Most of you know John. John's been on the school board. He's mm -hmm. chairman of the school board. Chairman of the school board. And uh, currently John is the um, chairman of the First Reserve Corporation. Uh, that's located in Connecticut. It's right. Greenwich, Connecticut. That's the location. Right. Now, how did you meet this, this man of yours? I mean... We were both undergraduates at SMU and um, were actually hanging political posters running for political office uh -huh. at the time we met each other. And what? he gave me a ride home and Might things guess. moved from there. <laughs> So, but were you married, um, you, then what, what year were you married? Um, uh, after I returned from Norway. We were married in 65, 1965. And what, what brought, what took you to Norway? I had a graduate fellowship, a Rotary fellowship, and hmm. went there and studied history. That must have been wonderful. Uh, I chose it because I'd grown up on the Mexican border and had never lived in a cold climate, so I thought it would be interesting to live in a... In the a different opposite. kind of co climate, which it was. I'm very sure, different. maximum. Yes. <laughs> maximum change. I'd never owned a long coat till I went there. So, Then you had, uh, before we get to what we're really going to cover on Maryland, you had two children. Yes. Tell us about Shannon. Well, I have two daughters, Shannon and Allison, both of whom right. have grown up here in Bronxville and attended the Bronxville school. Right. And Shannon is, I know you're very proud of her, and we saw Both her in the paper, yes, right. no, no less, during Christmas time. Right. Um, what is Shannon doing right now? Uh, Shannon's a lawyer. She's a graduate of law school recently and is the head of the domestic violence unit for legal services for Westchester and Putnam counties. Right. Lives in the city and commutes out here to wow. Westchester. Wow. 
big job. And Allison has just been married. She's a recently married lady who is now Allison Hill Edgar, uh -huh. and she is in a post-grad uh, or baccalaureate, post-baccalaureate uh, pre-med program getting all the science courses she failed to get because she wants to be a doctor. And she so didn't she's fail at the science courses. She <laughs> no, just no, no, didn't no. have them. She was a, a fine arts major. Oh, and and one doesn't spend much time in science as a fine arts major and then decided right. she wanted to be a doctor. So now she's getting the courses for well, that. That's wonderful. She'll get caught up. Um, and you, Marilyn, before we go on to discuss um, your publications, have just been so active in the community. Uh, let's see, I, I don't know where to begin, but one thing that's very interesting and very current right now is that you are co-chair of the um, centennial celebration that's coming up. Um, just tell us very shortly, quickly, you know, a little bit about that. Uh, well, our centennial of incorporation of a village, a hundred year anniversary will be Bronxville's hundred year yeah. anniversary as the incorporation of the village will be in 1998. Now we've of course been a much older community than that, several hundred years old, but mm -hmm. uh, we are going to celebrate that centennial in April, starting in April of this next year. Uh, Bob Riggs and I are the co-chairman of the Dude. committee. Perfect selection. And Mayor Han has been very uh, involved in pulling together all a series of committees that will be helping to do this. And many of you in the community are going to be called upon to help with this year-long celebration. Well, I think uh, really everybody would enjoy doing something a little bit. Yes, not only you. Peter North here is already has a Peter job is doing our it. Cameraman. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, a lot of people who will be involved, and we're That's hoping great. for lots of volunteers. Yeah. So. And then I'm just going to list a few of these, and then we're going to go on okay. and talk about your, your, uh, what you've written. I mean, you've been uh, <coughs> chair of the Board of Ethics of Bronxville. The, this was under Sheila Stein when she was uh, right. Yeah, mayor and secretary to the Bronxville School Foundation. And um, you've been on the friends board of the Friends of Sarah Lawrence, and um, you were the founder of the uh, Bronxville Foreign Policy Luncheon Series, and you did that whole series on Suddenly Single which was mm -hmm. over the library, I think I remember. Anyway, um, just an awful lot of involvement. <clears throat> so I don't, that, so when you see what she's been doing, writing and researching in the interim, you'll wonder just how she's pulled this all off. But um, let's really begin with your, your publications. I think we can make one really broad generalization. All, almost all your publications have concerned women. Is that is Yes, that it, it turned out that way. I hadn't necessarily intended to write about women because as you and I were discussing earlier, I am uh, pre-women's history in the colleges, but as it's turned out, my interests are in women and in education and so much of what I've written about has been about women. About women. And one of the first <clears throat> things you began to do is you've written bi little biographies in the Dictionary uh, of American Biography of various women. Um, mm -hmm. Who are some of the more interesting ones you've written? Um, well, I've done a series of these recently. These are things that are my most recent writings because um, these are reference works, Dictionary of American Biography, American National Biography, and Scribner's American Biography. I've done about 14 that I've been working on, and I tend to choose women. Um, two of the more interesting ones that I, I get asked about are Marvella Bai, who mm -hmm. was Senator Birch Bai's wife. She's one that I get asked to speak about on sort of panels talking about political women. And then I did Martha Mitchell. I tend to try to choose topics that um, I have some personal interest in knowing or that somebody I knew worked for them or there's some connection mm -hmm. and Tell you always enjoy Martha researching. Mitchell. She's sort of a tragedy, isn't she? Yes, and I and I she was uh, one that I chose because of course I remembered her as you would from all of the um, uh, Nixon era. Nixon era and the Watergate era and the final sort of prognosis on her life, people said Martha was right and still say that. Yeah. Fact, someone was just talking to me about her this weekend, that she was a tragic figure. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she would make these telephone calls? She would make the nocturne. She was uh, Attorney General John Mitchell's wife and mm -hmm. didn't see why a cabinet wife couldn't speak her own mind. And so she would make late night phone calls to the newspaper and often the Arkansas Gazette and she had one time been very angry over Senator Fulbright's opposition to a Supreme Court candidate, so she called and suggested that they crucify um, <laughs> Senator Fulbright, and she got lots of notoriety. <laughs> and then she put together the information for um, well, uh, for these, for it's these a reference people. source. So first of all, how long is how long do you get to write? Uh, not on? much. That's the problem. They're usually two thousand words or yeah. so, and you have to do the same amount of research for this as you would for a much longer biography. So the difficulty is trying to distinguish 
distill your information so that you're covering all the major details of the life, but then still give some interpretive framework to what the life was about. Mm -hmm. And Martha Mitchell is seen somewhat as a folk figure. She was Ask, she was included. I'm sent a list of people. Choose who you'd like to write about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And hers was because uh, I see that she's a celebrity and a political wife, but also became somewhat of a folk hero because some people were very disillusioned with their government during the Nixon era, right. saw her as um, forthright and honest when others weren't. She was patriotic. Others mm -hmm. saw her as totally outrageous and um, someone who was destructive rather than constructive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So she had two very different points of view on her. She, next to President uh, Nixon at the time, she was the most frequently requested speaker in that administration. Right. She had a nice southern draw uh, yes. and she could really speak. Right? It was a very stiletto heels, uh, the little southern woman with right. the beehive hairdo, the dimples, blonde dimples. Yeah. Yes, so that, uh, John she was, Mitchell divorced her in the end, isn't that? If I no, he, he didn't. She actually died a married woman. She got cancer. It was a tragic yeah. end. He, um, she, he initiated uh, divorce proceedings. They were in the process. They, they yeah. had had a separation agreement, but uh, he never paid what he was supposed to pay her in separation. She really, in life, wanted to be a good patriot and a good wife. Mm -hmm. And so she, to the end, I think would have liked to have been married to John Mitchell. He just, in the middle of the night, got up and left one night, never spoke to her again, never saw her again. And uh, they were by wow. that point, he had resigned from the Nixon administration. And then wow. she was sort of the first to come public and say, you know, there's something wrong at Watergate and the president's involved. And at first, when she had been so outrageous, people thought she was, you know, the Crazy. president said, give him hell, Martha, and yeah. she isn't she cute, you know. And then when she started saying things they didn't want her to say, then she was yeah, interpreted differently. Right. Well, we're actually coming to us uh, the topic of prostitution, which I know will interest you greatly, so we're going to have to move, move on. on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to say at the beginning, and should have, is that Marilyn has written a whole book on prostitutes in New York City, but I'm going to hold that obey for just a second and ask you about another, you know, about a specific woman you really got interested in, which was Elizabeth Custer, uh, the wife of um, General Custer. Right. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, again, my interest came from living here in Bronxville. She has two houses here in Bronxville, where or had houses? two houses. Yeah, where are the houses? Uh, they're on the hilltop. One of them is 20 Park Avenue, I believe is the address, and the other mm -hmm. is 6 Chestnut. And they were houses she had built in the 1890s, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And she came here as a widow because of friends from her hometown. And I used to walk by, see the houses, knew she'd had them, started doing research on her, discovered Just there like was that. no biography on her. Uh -huh. And so I started researching a book that I had hoped to write. And I still, I have the research, but... Uh, have not finished but the book. you did an article for it in the I've Villager. I've done an article in the Villager, right. And, and I speak about her very frequently. She is my most popular topic to talk about. Why didn't you write the book? Well, I was in the process of doing the research, and it was at Little Bighorn Battlefield when I discovered um, someone there said, did we mention to you that somebody else is doing a book on her? And I said what no, and they Mary. gave me the name, and I called and talked to the historian who was just at that point taking her manuscript to the publisher. Uh, so I decided I would wait a few years and then come out with a whole new interpretation. So I'm mm -hmm. about that point. It's Are about you? time. Are you going to come out with something? Well, I need to do the hard work of writing the yeah. book first. I have the research. Well, but, the Villager uh, article that you wrote really brought out the point that she had these friends, the Bates, who we know, some of whom we know here in, right. in Bronxville, and they. A circle of, I think you call the... A circle of friends. Friends, yeah. This was a family. She and General Custer both came from Monroe, Michigan, mm -hmm. and so did the Bates family. And they moved here. It was actually one of the young Bates sisters who moved here uh, that had lived with the Custers out in uh, the Dakota Territory mm -hmm. when they were at Fort Lincoln for a year. And she was here as a married woman and happened to be Sarah Lawrence was also a Bates and William Van Duzer Lawrence had also come here to visit this Agnes Bates, uh, Wellington, and bought the land that's now the Lawrence Park, mm -hmm. Hilltop. And then um, Elizabeth Custer came and had a summer home here to be near her friend Agnes hmm. and then stayed so all active together. in Bronxville. Right. Yeah, in a community. She also, one of the Bates um, sons, or the brother of Agnes and uh, Sarah La Bates Lawrence, uh, was also in love with Elizabeth Custer and oh, that's right. would like to have married her, but she chose General Custer instead. Right. I remember reading that he didn't marry after that, after he proposed or something for 10 years. Right. Oh, tragedy. Anyway, let's, let's move on to really um, what is your major 
uh, work of work uh, so far, I assume. And, and that is um, a book that was published <coughs> by the University of California Press, um, Their Sisters Keepers. Uh, first, tell us just a little bit about, about this book and how you got started on it. Well, the book actually started as my doctoral dissertation, mm -hmm. and I had um, chose the topic. Um, I was We were moving to Bronxville at the time, so I needed a topic that I could do research on here in New York, and my field of interest was um, 19th century uh, history, and I was going to do a topic on reformers, religious reformers. Religious reformers. Religious reformers in the 19th century. There were a number of reform societies that focused on prostitutes, uh -huh. one of them being the um, Society for the Preservation of the Seventh Commandment. Which is, uh, which is thou shalt not commit adultery. adultery. Yes, right. Okay. So oh, oh. that was one of there was many. There society for yes, that? Yes, right. It was a national oh, group. Wow. Uh, so I, I started have a hard doing. Time <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I started doing research on the religious reformers and discovered that the prostitutes' lives were more interesting than the religious reformers. And so, so you I switched, your topic switched to my topic, started looking at their public lives. Then now, what to, period are we talking about? We're talking about 1830 to 1870. And why did you pick that period? Uh, well, it sort of has to figure, it's, it, it carves out its own time period. You try to decide, once I started studying them, 1830 was a year when things were changing in New York. Uh -huh. And uh, prostitution all of a sudden seemed to just appear on the landscape. It had obviously, uh, it's the world's oldest, oldest profession, profession, but it uh, seemed to appear anew to people. And prostitutes Actually, were. Motherhood is the oldest profession. Yes, right. Okay. <laughs> Second oldest profession. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> anyway, so prostitutes all of a sudden seemed to be um, uh, appear visible on the landscape. People mm -hmm. got worried about it as a problem, a moral problem, a uh, social problem. And um, a number of the reformers were interested in them, as well as a study was done around 1830 that mm -hmm. claimed there were 10,000 prostitutes in New York City. Is that true? Uh, well, that would have meant that one out of every 10 females of all ages, little children included, would have been a prostitute. So it was a gross Very exaggeration. But, um, but but Marilyn, there was no you know eyewitness news at that time. We don't no. have. I mean, how in the world? <laughs> how in the world did you get your information? I mean, uh, well, that that was the difficult part uh, because I. I had, once I decided to do this, usually you choose a topic if you're doing elections or something. You go, or politics, you go and study elections, and there's the results of the election, there's the newspaper ads, there's the right. campaign, right. there's a body of material. Didn't, yeah. There was no body of material. So I wasn't even sure I could do it because you need primary sources for um, a dissertation. A dissertation. Uh, but I gradually began to piece together bits and pieces. There were uh, the reformers' records it told me something about how people viewed prostitutes, and you had some of their life histories in there. And there were brothel guidebooks that were printed in the middle 19th century, and I found several of those now, in the library. Now, what are brothel guidebooks? Well, Is they it were how books to find a good brothel? Exactly. I oh. mean, it was sort of, you know, like we have Zagats today. <laughs> you had the brothel. You had, exactly. you had free rating. Right. Right. the best. <laughs> well, they did the same thing. They would tell you on, uh, you know, 55 Leonard Street or, or 33 Church Street, mm -hmm. um, Cinderella Marshall has the madam of this wonderful thing. They serve good wines. They have 15 inmates, they would call them. Uh, ladies who are, you know, very charming, or they would give it a bad rating uh -huh. and say, you know, the, the madam is, you know, obnoxious, um, and the, the girls, you know, are don't behave themselves or right, whatever. Right, they would give you a, a description of the right. brothel. This so gave there was a me, real hierarchy There was of a hierarchy, brothels. absolutely a hierarchy of brothels. And what was the brothels. best brothel? I mean, was there a... Well, that changed all the time, I right. guess. But there were some that, you know, were... Kate Hastings had a very famous one. Cinderella Marshalls was considered to be a good one. Oh. Um, <laughs> they, and it depends on which decade you're looking. But this yeah. gave me names. And then after I had names of um, madams, I discovered that... Now, Madam runs the brothel, right? She She's was not the always manager. a prostitute. No, okay. not always a prostitute. Yeah. But I had her name, and sometimes they would list sort of the star of the brothel. Yeah. And I was using newspapers at the time. I was going through the daily newspapers of the Penny Press from the 1830s through 60, mm -hmm. uh, just to see what things were reported there. So you would get news on prostitutes, and I began to keep a list of those. Then I went to the census and discovered that I found some of these names skimming the census, and lo and behold, they'd be in a house with 11 other women mm -hmm. uh, and on a particular church. And so I began to cross-reference 
the, the census wow, with names I had. Smoothly. I would pick up. That's what I love about history. Yeah, it's detective work. Yeah, yeah, and you sort of begin to put together yeah. all of these little details or puzzles you put together. So then I went to tax records, and wonderfully, these women's names were appearing in the tax records. They paid taxes? They paid taxes in New York Bless City <laughs> up until 1859. You paid taxes not only on your real estate property, but on personal property. And these was, this was kept in the tax ledger also. So, so if you had so many women working he, for you, you had to pay pro Well, tax it was really tax not on them, but if you, um, the personal property within the household or the wealth that you had mm -hmm. yourself, that, that's what you were taxed on. Mm -hmm. So this became a better method for tracking women because that was taxed at the location where you live. You might be a real estate owner and you would own several pieces of property, but if you didn't live there, I wouldn't necessarily be able to track your mm -hmm. uh, tax-paying record. So this gave me a way to, and that's when I discovered that some of these women were doing quite well in the business so this and was accumulating a, assets. Really, some of them were, were really businessmen, women. Absolutely. The Especially those who stayed in the uh, profession for a length of time mm -hmm. could accumulate assets. So, I mean, we're assets. talking really pretty big bucks? Uh, well, I used, uh, once I began to track their resources uh, in the taxes, I came up with an index using an eighteen forty dollar was equivalent to six fifty right. in nineteen seventy, yeah. and then I used inflation to find out its value in nineteen ninety dollars. So, what was one of the wealthiest making? Um, she could well making and accumulating were two different things, okay. right? Accumulating so okay. that uh, in personal assets, these women would have maybe five hundred thousand dollars. Some of them, it could be anywhere. Those I in do dollars. in my book in today's yeah. dollars That's in. Those not bad. Not and you know if you had real estate property, it would be worth even more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, this was there, and what I did was take an appraised worth at that time. I also know you were appraised for one fifth to three fifths of its value. Right. So now, in reading the reviews, I mean, um, that you gave me, um, you, you know, they all state that really you sort of take a, a different view of prostitutes, more or less that these women really survived and, and helped each other and that this wasn't the end of the world. And could you talk a little bit about why you reached this conclusion? Um, well, well, first of all, why did women go into prostitution? Okay. Well, one of the things that I try to make clear in, uh, is that all women in the 19th century had limited options, mm -hmm. occupational options. Right. And so given the limited options available, prostitution was not such an unreasonable choice because of the economic rewards that one at least hoped they could get and in many cases I've been able to prove could they could get, could get yeah, yeah. so that um, though we're as one historian said we're still too near the Victorian era to see the opportunities in prostitution rather than the victimization that mm -hmm. it created uh, and that's been one of the things that by saying that it was of bad options it was you know perhaps for some women it was the best of their limited options mm -hmm people immediately see this as a very positive appraisal of prostitution, yeah. which it's not necessarily. I, th I think all women in the 19th century had limited options available right. to them. It could especially be a school teacher, a mother, or a wife. Right. And, but if you were not a wife or daughter that had a father helping take care of you, you had some real limitations on mm -hmm. how you could support yourself. The majority of women in the 19th century worked as domestics or seamstresses, mm -hmm. and you were paid as a seamstress uh, six and a half cents to 12 cents um, a shirt. And what did you get to be a prostitute? And so as a prostitute, and this is, say, if you work all day long as a, say, 18 hours a day as a seamstress, and, you and you're very cents. efficient, you can make one to two shirts a day. So maybe you make a dollar a week at most if you've just done nothing else but make shirts yeah. all week. How much would now, you get Now, that's prostitute? about the lowest price you were paid for being a prostitute. Uh -huh. And uh, I've tracked what women said they were paid, and most were paid anywhere from, I'd say, two to two to ten dollars mm -hmm. uh, for so going more. to bed. Uh, it didn't take a yeah. very smart woman to figure out that uh, going to bed with a man one time uh, was as lucrative as working maybe three weeks in the shirt trade. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of women, of course, there was a stigma associated with it. It was immoral to be a prostitute. So there was certainly a lot of women didn't choose this as a profession, but uh, the sewing trade, you might be dismissed. You might mm -hmm. be asked to give sexual favors in order to right. get the job being a seamstress. Um, so a lot of women found out that even working as hard as they could as a seamstress, they still couldn't meet their expenses. Mm -hmm. So you needed to supplement your income either by donations, by family, or by and getting it the best way you could. Now, the title also gives away another theme that you bring, Their Sister's Keepers. 
Right. There are a whole lot of ramifications of that. These that, women helped each other, right? They right. built whole communities? Uh, it's, they're sisters keepers in the sense that they were a community of women, mm -hmm. uh, a, a support network that they provided for each other, as well as the implication that they are being kept as kept women, or does a madam yeah. also keep a prostitute? So I look at a number of A number angles, of connotations, but right, nevertheless, they worked together, they weren't, um, and they helped each other, and... and uh, yes, that was one of the things that I found that I wouldn't, as you, I, your, the public life is what's in the police records, and you know you know that they're arrested so many times, you know where they live, you know where they pay taxes, mm -hmm. then you begin to see the sort of private ramifications. Um, much of what I found I was through things that would be testified in court, they would give a little bit about private lives, mm -hmm. or the House of Refuge had wonderful records that gave long histories of these young women, and then I had some personal correspondence that mm -hmm. helped me see the sort of networking that was existed in New York mm -hmm. among prostitutes did you and come away, with those in other cities. Did you come away feeling um, these were strong women? I mean, it, I mean how did you, how do you... Well, you come away feeling uh, there's a diverse group of women yeah. who are sort of accumulated together because they right, earned their money in the same way. Right. But there's a great diversity of the, those I call the... the professional full-time prostitutes who worked in brothels or who did this as a living mm -hmm. and then there were so many other women. The majority of the prostitutes were occasional prostitutes. When you were in the fur trade and you didn't have a job all summer you might be a prostitute for a short while just to supplement your income. Mm -hmm. You fell on hard times. You might go out once mm -hmm. just to sort of supplement your income. Most women who were in prostitution did it occasionally when they needed to or for two or three years of their lives. Mm -hmm. They were not lifetime, lifetime prostitutes. You pointed out that there were no pimps during that period. Why is well, that? Well, there, there were men who sometimes operated as pimps, but the pimp system is such where you have uh, complete control of the assets and over the public and private life of the prostitute did not exist at that particular time. I think now there's a debate among historians when this happens. Mm -hmm. You know, does it happen earlier or later? But I could not find men who had the same control over women's lives as we define a pimp today. Most um, most prostitutes today, the men, a pimp does have control. Well, unless you're in some of your upper level uh, brothels. Yeah. The but at that Mayflower, yes, Mayflower, the Mayflower or, man. At that point, there were definitely men. They had most prostitutes wanted to have a lover. Uh, there were sentinels in these. Um, brothels that guarded um, for your safety mm -hmm. um, and there were some who surely took on the pimping function but not a whole network where there are third party uh, people taking uh, off uh, I would say the assets of the mm -hmm. prostitute so that, are in the process. Yeah. This happens in about the 1870s where the political system in New York changes. Uh, Tammany and, takes yeah. control of New York City's government again and um, at that particular point, the sort of political business economic system is in the hands of um, a, a group of men, and they take over the prostitution world as well, mm -hmm. and that's when the pimps come in, and you and have these third-party third participants. Yeah. Up to that point, one of the things I say is unique about prostitution is that women basically were in control of the of the profession between 1830 and 1870 and it was a small window of opportunity where it was under the control the, right. of women and, <laughs> and uh, uh, women could sort of change houses easily. They didn't seem to be wedded to any particular house. It wasn't uh -huh. you got into this particular brothel and you were stuck there until you were kicked out. They seemed to have uh, some degree of control over the bartering of their mm -hmm. goods within mm -hmm. the system as well as with clients. Yeah. And some of them were educated. Yes. Which is the letters you got? Some of the letters of right. Of them. Yeah. There was a a study that uh, a doctor had done at the prison hospital, uh, looking at backgrounds. And prostitutes came from all walks of life. You had former school teachers. You had those who had come from very comfortable families as well as poor. But the majority of prostitutes came from, um, I would say, poor economic circumstances. And they had those that had worked before had been either seamstresses or domestics, yeah. housekeepers. Mm -hmm. Um, but there were some who were educated, and the letters you're referring to belong to a prostitute named Helen Jewett, who um, had widespread notoriety, I would say, and she fame murdered, in the 19th wasn't? century. She yeah. was murdered. In fact, she was little known until she was murdered. She was known within the trade, <laughs> yeah. but she was not so well known until this axe murder in 1836, and the new penny press or the public newspapers, that there were lots of newspapers in New York at the time, and they covered the story every day in detail, and it became 
Uh, it was covered in the press in Texas as well as up in Maine. It became mm -hmm. a national news story and for a couple of months uh, until the court, uh, the case was over in the court. It was it really followed focused, daily. Though, attention on, on, on prostitution. prostitution. And um, it sort of affirmed for some that yes, the world was in a terrible shape. And yeah. you look at New York, the moral decay that existed there. But the interesting thing about her life was that she didn't fit the moralistic stereotype of, you know, the poor woman who's gone downhill. Degradation mm -hmm. and death certainly was there, but it was not... Uh, death because of the disease in the field, which these were the real and uh, certainly the drawbacks of being prostitution were the violence, disease, right. and everyone the knew disease. those. But what she illustrated was, you know, she came to an untimely death, but she had, she was educated, she had had this vast correspondence with clients, with other prostitutes, with friends. She had had lovely clothes, people knew her and seen her in the community. She seemed to dress well, she had a wonderful. Um, apartment that was being described, you know, her mm -hmm. room, the, the linens, the furnishings, the leather books on must her desk. Have been something. Um, must have really. And so she didn't quite fit in, and that, that showed that it that was the second side of prostitution that, yeah. that people talked about how awful it was and it was the ruin of your life, but very few people talked about the fact that maybe there were reasons women got into it, and this was the positive pull of prostitution mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was that other. She yeah. illustrates both sides, the dangers as well as the positive aspects. One last question on this. Uh, what is prostitution like today? How does it differ from... Uh, um well, there are obviously a whole lot more economic opportunities for women today, for women, they, and uh, we also have more support systems. I mean, at that particular time, um, you... If there was no one, if you fell on hard times, though they said, you know, you could get help in the community, you really couldn't. There was one agency in New York City that uh, determined there were 195,000 men, women, and children who were in desperate need, mm -hmm. and it would take them 10 cents a day to feed them. And so the allotted money they gave to take care of this group uh, would feed them for, it was $41,000 short of what they needed to feed them for one week. So there wasn't much available. Right. So a woman today has resources. There are agencies, both government and private, right. that can help a woman. Uh, she has occupational opportunities. She didn't. She has educational opportunities. She but didn't. She uh, women in that time who were married could not own property in their own name in this mm -hmm. early period, uh, though prostitutes could and widows and single women could own property, mm -hmm. but not married women. Uh, there also, the double standard was a terrible problem. You made one mistake and in many families you were kicked out or the public saw you as a as a whore, uh, or as a whore. you were on your you were um, on That's your way it. to destruction. If not, you were if you had a child to care for, an illegitimate child, you were thrown out of your household and oh, wow. condemnation of public condemnation. Whereas today, I think our sexual mores are much more tolerant of um, extramarital or uh, outside of marriage affairs. Right, so that right. um, people are more tolerant. Maybe very tolerant, maybe too tolerant these days. <laughs> maybe. Anyway, yes. well, it's a fascinating topic, <laughs> Marilyn. You must have had a great time I researching I it. I love and, research. Uh, getting to know these women and feeling And you do get them. to know them. Once right. you get involved in their lives, they, they're they like friends. Yeah. And then you'll, you'll know one's a prostitute. I had one name and I just kept waiting. I knew she was a prostitute. I had to have sort of a double level of verification yeah. before you got into my list of prostitutes. And there was one where I just knew she was a prostitute, but I could never find the verification. I was sitting in the library one day, and I stumbled across it, and I just wanted to go, yes! <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I had been well, involved in her life. I wish we could go on. We, we have a whole other topic that Marilyn has, and that is widows, but we're just not going to have time to, to talk mm -hmm. about it now. But I understand you're working on a book. Uh, or I, a publication on widows. Two years that I spent yeah. doing it as a project, a uh, fellowship I was given, um, an appointee, at, I should say, at and, and this is Radcliffe the at the Schlesinger Library. And it's, again, right. 19th century women. And once you lost your husband, that was it. It was a difficult time, right. Yeah. Although some women, again, I mean, I always seem to see women not so much as victims, but the agency in choosing to... Uh, though very limited possibilities, and there are certainly difficulties, women seem to be re very resourceful mm -hmm. in locating possibilities. And even widows, many of them who were left uh, without a husband, they had to raise minors, became quite resourceful mm -hmm. and managed to take care of themselves and their families, just as prostitutes had. Yeah. And then we're not going to even get to your centennial book, but just briefly, what's your centennial book? Uh, uh, Mary what, Huber and I are co-authoring a um, book. Uh, Arcadia Publisher got in touch yeah. with me and said, we want to do a community history of Bronxville, which is a pictorial history. 
And so Mary and I are going to co-author this. We've been going through the village archives and, in fact, would like pictures from anyone that has old photos. It's from, you know, Bronxville's early history through the present time that might be interesting uh, to put into this book mm -hmm. that would help tell the history of Bronxville through photos. They'll have captions That's and great. an introduction. Yeah. But um, we're hoping that this will be, it we'll should be it out next every fall. Coffee table in oh, I hope so. Yes, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, Marilyn, thank you so much for thank joining you, Marcia. us. Thank you, Marcia. It's a pleasure to be here. I have to say a special thank you to somebody who got very bold in Mexico, jop, jumped on a uh, motorcycle, and wouldn't you know it flipped over. That's our cameraman, Peter North, <laughs> and hurt his shoulder. Peter's going to have an operation very soon, so we all need to write him thank you notes. But I just wanted to thank Peter for coming in today. If you can see him here, his arm is all wrapped up and everything, and yet he's still here on the job. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Marsha. And thank all of you for joining us. Mm -hmm.